Welcome, my name is Adina McNichol. I'm an Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at Vanderbilt University. I'm joined here by Anne Gleg, who is Associate Professor of Religion and Cultural Studies at the University of Central Florida. We're here as part of the Teaching Resources for Buddhism, Race and Racism Project, which is being hosted by teachingbuddhism.net and funded by the Robert H. N. Ho Foundation uh, Center at the University of Toronto. We're joined here today by Sarah Jacoby, who is an Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Charles Deering McCormick Professor of Teaching Excellence at Northwestern University. Dr. Jacoby is a scholar of Asian religions with a specialization in Tibetan Buddhism, and her research interests include Indo-Tibetan doctrine and ritual in practice, gender and sexuality, Tibetan literature, Buddhism uh, and contemplation, um, and Tibetan Buddhism in general. So welcome, Professor Jacoby, and we're looking forward to talking with you about your teaching and your syllabi. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you, uh, Professor McNichol and Gleg. So I was wondering if you could begin by just telling us a little bit about your research specialization and some of your interests. Sure, thank you. Um, so I work on Tibetan Buddhism broadly. Um, I'm interested in Tibetan literature, forms of life writing in particular, and gender and sexuality studies. I think of myself as a historian of religion um, in terms of how I would define my field. And um, these days I'm mostly feeling guilty about not getting enough work done on a full translation of the autobiography of Sarah Kondro Dewey Dorje, who is a Tibetan female visionary um, who lived in the early 20th century. And I am chipping away at that. Um, and the other project I'm actively writing these days is I'm rewriting a textbook that I published with Don Mitchell called Buddhism Introducing the Buddhist, Buddhist Experience. Yeah, that's what I think we called it. Um, <laughs> and so that's, that's actually making me think a lot actually about pedagogy and what goes in a book and how to say it and that type of thing. Looking forward to, I know that there's just a conference too on Buddhism in the body and they looked at textbooks, including your textbook. And so I'm interested to see what goes into the, the revisions and the updated version of this textbook, if race makes it in, if the body makes it in, uh, and where. Uh, um, so, actually, I have no idea. I didn't know that it was discussed in a conference. <laughs> and I'd be curious to hear more about that at another time. But a short answer to that is yes, I'm rewriting the chapter on them um, loosely on modern Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a good segue into thinking about teaching. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about where you teach, what the student body is like, and what your typical teaching load is, and what kinds of classes you normally teach? Yeah, thank you. Um, so at Northwestern University, um, we have about 8,000 undergraduates and about 12 or 13,000 graduate students. Um, it's a kind of highly selective, R1 Midwestern University. If I were to give you like my actual quick version of an assessment of the climate of what, what it's like here, I would say it's heavily pre-professional. Students come here with a mission. Sometimes I am one of the people that welcomes incoming first years in our orientation program. And um, they often come in under the archway, kind of formally becoming university students. And then they sit, we sit on the grass together and they tell me that they wanna be lawyers or they wanna be doctors. You know, they have their entire schedule completely worked out already. And so some of what I try to do with Northwestern students is tone down the ambition and try to think about the process of learning and meaning making and what's important. And so, um, that's a little bit about the, the feel of this place. Um, so I teach a 2-2 teaching load, but I am blessed with the fact that I'm on the quarter system. So a 2-2 teaching load for me means um, essentially half of the year I'm teaching and the other half, summer and one quarter, I'm focusing on research um, so that there's a balance between the two um, in my life. and. I find them both very much mutually informative projects. Um, 
The biggest course I teach is Introduction to Buddhism. Um, I haven't seen the data recently, but at least pre-pandemic, Introduction to Buddhism was the most popular course in my department, which is the Department of Religious Studies. And we literally cannot teach the course enough. Um, it fills within a, a you know the first day that registration opens. It's um, actually not because the professors are so stellar. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's actually because of certain ways in which Buddhism is aligned with um, mindfulness and de-stressing and the sort of psychologization of Buddhism as a pathway to healing that students encounter, um, say, when they go to the psychological services and learn about mindfulness. You know, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Um, this is a high pressure kind of place. And students are really dealing with a lot of stress, anxiety, and depression these days, not just the pandemic, but kind of more broadly. So I think that may play into why Buddhism classes are um, historically so much in demand. Um, so there's intro Buddhism. I also teach upper level undergraduate courses that are more thematized, like Buddhism and gender, um, this one, Buddhism in the contemporary world, Tibetan religion and culture, feminist theory in the study of religion, theory and method in the study of religion. So those are some of the ones that I cycle through often. It's a great collection of courses. I think, you know, my experience is the same. A lot of my students wind up in my Buddhism classes because uh, they're being introduced to mindfulness as a mental health resource. And then they show up in my class um, wanting to know more about it, having questions about like the ethics of it. Um, so yeah, probably a lot of people have that same experience. Uh, so in terms of your courses, are, which classes have you incorporated material on Buddhism, race, and racism? So that subject is in particular interwoven into my Introduction to Buddhism course. And um, the course syllabus that I shared with your project called Buddhism in the Contemporary World, um, I try to center um, thinking about race and racism, beginning with that in Buddhism in the Contemporary World. Um, in Introduction to Buddhism, that is not exactly the beginning. It's, it's more about how we study religion and a Buddha Dharma Sangha kind of typical intro Buddhism model. It's mostly when I try to narrate the story of how we have come to think of this thing called Buddhism, that thinking about race, racism, and colonialism emerge. So how we tell the story of Buddhism as it has been inflected by British colonial imperial rule in South Asia, that, that version, but also how Buddhism came to America and whose voices we center in that story. So that's something I really try to bring out in my intro class, um, as well as the more upper level seminar classes. Mm. Well, I'm gonna take over. Um, so I know that Adina would be really kind of excited to hear that about how you know, you really engage questions of race and colonialism from the very beginning as part of the, you know, the story of Buddhism. I think that, you know, one thing that we've, you know, kind of discovered through these kind of chats is that for most scholars of Buddhism, they are, we, you know, we are only bringing in race in, you know, the North American context. And so that kind of does a certain type of work that, you know, aligns these issues with certain types of populations, which we actually want to disrupt. So I think it's really powerful that you're, you know, really tackling it from the start. That race is, you know, right there at the beginning in how, you know, scholars have thought and constructed Buddhism. So that's like something I'm heartened to hear. Um, I'm wondering if you have like one example that you can focus on um, that worked well, that you could maybe, you know, recommend to colleagues? Sure. Um, in my um, Buddhism in the Contemporary World class, uh, that class starts with what I call a class covenant project, 
-hmm. where before we even have a conversation about anything, um, an entire class period is dedicated to going into small groups and thinking about how do we want to speak to each other? How do we want to be heard? What are the, the rules and um, standards for our discourse in this space? Um, and that this was pre-pandemic actually. So we'd have to think about how we define space in the, um, the Zoom environment, but in, in the in-person class, there's literally a physical space. When you walk in here, how do we speak to each other? How do we respect each other? Um, and so these small groups think about how, to, how they want this conversation to go. Um, and I think that's been helpful because one of the um, elements of handling extremely sensitive personal information about people's um, feelings about race and their own backgrounds and racial formations, um, there, we have to establish a kind of trust and rapport mm -hmm. to be willing to share that. Um, that's how that class starts. And then towards the end of the class, we've tried to, I've, I've been using the book Radical Dharma to think about what it what it means to actually have a talking book, how to bring a book like that into conversation. So um, that book is also, I would say, I think uh, I'm trying to tell you the positive, but I have to give you one caveat of one of the challenges. <laughs> so at Northwestern, students are hyper vigilant about race and racism mm -hmm. in the sense that they're petrified to say something wrong. Mm -hmm. So there's this constant internal checking system that students are coming at the subject with. And they're all trying to be more careful than the next. Um, so finding ways to break that down and, and feel okay with sharing a view, regardless of whether it's the right way to talk about race, is one of my big challenges. With Radical Dharma, I've done something really kind of simple, um, and that is pick out a quote from the reading today that really speaks to you, and read the quote out loud to your small group in the class, and share your feelings about it. So trying to break out of a kind of intellectualized frame of what is correct to utter about race to more of an embodied feeling that is tied to the book as, as a kind of buoy in a sea of discomfort um, that we're all sharing the same reading and we can pin our thoughts to that and then expand out. Sorry, that was probably too no, long. No, no, I mean, it, I feel like we could do the whole into the whole chart just on that right there's so much in there so I guess you know the things that stand out for me in what you say is that you're really kind of centering relationality at the very start of the class like building relationality as the kind of holding space to have these really diff you know difficult conversations um you know it, it's quite interesting because I you know also share I think all of the, you know, all of the things that you've spoken are, are issues that we're all struggling with. Um, and the way that I've tackled it is to do race at the end. Like I, my classes are typically um, organized into four modules and I've typically done race, the focus on race. I mean, I pick threads up, but I really focus on race in the last module with the kind of idea that by then we've really built up trust in the class, you know, that it just takes a while to get to that space. Um, but you're really inspiring me to kind of push harder and really start. Um, and actually one of the students in my evals last semester said, I loved doing, you know, I love the module on race and I wish we'd done it earlier. So it was like, you know, it's kind of interesting. I'm like, wow, I'm getting some messages here that I need to push that, you know, push, push forward um and I love how you're using radical dharma as what did you say like a like an anchor an anchor in a sea of discomfort um and bringing the body in as well which I think is really a feature of you know racial justice work now you know the somatics of race um 
so yeah no I'm super excited and really happy that you shared that there's just a lot there um when you just said that you made me think of a couple more comments it uh I know you didn't just ask me a question but can I <laughs> no go for it of course <laughs> okay um <laughs> So in some sense, uh, radical dharma is at the end of my syllabus in Buddhism in the contemporary world. So I suppose the reason for that is that I felt it would be ex especially sensitive and that I should wait um, for that rapport and trust to build. But I think just like when we talk about gender, it doesn't always have to mean that we talk about women, right? We want to center women, but we want to be thinking about gender and constructions of sexuality throughout our analysis of the um, formation of knowledge and how we're expressing it and recording it. Um, likewise, we want to be careful when we teach about race and racism to have it not only come up when we're talking about African Americans. And so right. in this class, thinking about race is interwoven in the sense that um, it's really looking at the commodification and um, kind of extraction of concepts of mindfulness from Buddhist spaces where experts are often Asian monastics to spaces in Euro-American cultural contexts where the experts are psychologists or scientists and the people teaching are wearing business suits <clears throat> and are white. And so really thinking about um, whose expertise we're building on and who's being footnoted or cited is something that we can think a lot about as we look at how Buddhist mindfulness has been incorporated into the attention economy, into the tech industry, into the medical industry, um, into the kind of whole foods Buddhism that you encounter. <laughs> Actually, I, I have students go to, there are two whole foods in our neighborhood um, and I have students in this class go and walk around and just try to see where like visual images or words that are Buddhist appear and to think about what kind of advertising work, what kind of messages, what kind of visual encounter people are having um, with Buddhism and why and, and what's making money. So anyway, I, I think that the racial formation yeah. of Buddhism in America is, is visible throughout all of these forms yeah not just in radical dharma you know yeah no no absolutely and i just want to give adina a shout out because i think you know she, adina i don't know if you want to kind of chip in here but i know that that's something you're really passionate about about not just sectioning off race you know to the african-american or even the asian-american experience but really you know bringing it in as a hermeneutic and a, of how we think and teach and people do buddhism and I think we've talked about doing like a wrap up conversation after we finish, you know, interviewing everybody on their syllabi. And maybe I can talk a little bit about mine. I mean, for context, you know, I've been teaching for like a year and a half. Uh, most of it's been in the pandemic situation. But, you know, in this most recent uh, syllabus on Buddhism that I did, race does come up at the very beginning when we talk about sort of the ways that certain uh, prioritized modes of knowledge are associated with race, the fact that the identification of the Buddha as Aryan and with philosophy and doctrine as part of this kind of like Aryan um, understanding of Buddhism uh, isn't a coincidence. It's connected to how Buddhism is continuing to be racialized. But I also first bring up race and ethnicity in Asia uh, when we reach the Myanmar unit, we talk about the impact of colonialism uh, and we talk about Know, what is going on with the Rohingya. We talk about how race and ideas of like race and ethnicity are already interwoven there. So by the time we get to, you know, the discussion on Buddhism and race, and we talk about Black Buddhists, uh, you know, it's not like Black Buddhists have to do all the speaking for what yeah. it means to right. um, be racialized within Buddhism. That's really important. I'd love to see your syllabus sometime. Um, sure. um, all right, I'll just I'll move us on a little bit just with an eye to the time. Um, are there any themes that you find really in la I mean, I bet you the students love that like Whole Foods uh, 
tasks that you give them but is there anything else that you wanted to kind of share that really kind of engages them in buddhism in the contemporary world um i tried to make that syllabus multimedia oriented so we're not just reading books but we're also listening to ted talks we're meeting people guest speakers and um one of my assignments was to we used this software called yellow dig to create a blog you can also do this with facebook but I was having um, anti-Facebook <laughs> time. And so, rightly so, rightly so. <laughs> so I used Yellow Dig, with it, which is incorporated into Northwestern's online Canvas software kind of package. So basically my students created a blog and I asked them to, you know, I gave them course points for posting so they would feel that it was important and not just like a sidelined project. And I asked them to note to photo it was supposed to be visual right that's why I wanted the blog format and not just a discussion thread um, where students would take pictures of any experience they had in which a, a Buddha statue or words they thought that came from Buddhism appeared in their lives and again this was pre-pandemic and so students were like going out to bars in the city in Chicago and um, and it was just fascinating that per wow. they were amazed as well and in the beginning students told me oh you know I don't know how to do a blog I don't know if I like what is this really going to do they're they're so primed to like when is the paper due around here you know it's like yeah. pretty, um that, that everybody's marching on aiming to pick up their A's so they can get into medical school around here so telling them to take a picture of what they saw at the bar last night is is a little bit out of like their expectation of what work is. And, and the students couldn't stop marveling at the images that each other were, were posting. And so I think through the oh. act of being asked to pay attention to the, I don't know if we want to call it commod commodification, whitewashing, um, cultural extraction, cultural appropriation of mindfulness and Buddhist oriented um, visual and textual material. I think they really liked that. Oh yeah, that sounds amazing. And also I'm um, really getting the sense of how subversive you are. <laughs> <laughs> You're really disrupting that Northwestern uh, straight route a little bit there. So kudos for that. Um, so we all know as teachers that we learn as much from our failures as our successes. Um, is there anything that hasn't worked so well for you that maybe you do differently or that you decided, I'm just going to put that aside? I think before I started trying to center race and racism in my teaching in the Buddhist studies context, I think I expected the big problem to be hostility between people or um, different viewpoints. Um, but what I discovered here, and this may be really culturally specific to the climate that I'm talking about, I don't know how common this would be in different regions of the country. Um, but as I've mentioned already, what I discovered is that people are just unwilling to speak about it at all. They're unwilling uh, to utter thoughts, not because they don't value it or think it's important. Undergraduates tend to be um, thinking in detail about race and racism in their conversations, in their dorms, you know, in their personal life with their friends. But there's just such an, a, a concern about not wanting to say the wrong thing you know, and so I think I need to really think about that more and, and try to find ways to break that down and try to do my best to find um, ways to enhance safety in contexts where they might hear something that is really painful. Um, yeah. And my classes are diverse. There are people who are identified in, in all different ways coming to these classes. And so there's a fear about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've studied, you know, Buddhist like racial justice work and kind of North American kind of majority white sanghas and 
you know, they're struggling with the same issues. And, you know, that's some of the reason why they've gone for a kind of, you know, POC only groups and white awake groups, you know, to kind of avoid some of the pain that can come from the mixed spaces. Um, but we don't really have that option, you know, in the kind of in the classroom. So I think it does. Yeah, it does take a lot of thinking, you know, together. And I think I mean, this is kind of why we want to do this series to kind of share you know, strategies with our colleagues. Um, so I'm sure that a lot of listeners to this, you know, talk will definitely empathize with, with, with what you say. Okay, so our last question is kind of like a vision dream question. Um, if you could teach a whole class on Buddhism, race and racism, how would you kind of, you know, how would you do that? Um, thank you for asking that. Um, I'm especially happy that you asked that because um, the syllabus that I shared with you, the Buddhism in the Contemporary World syllabus, I, I created this in, um, I guess it was 2017 or 2018, getting ready for my first iteration of this version of the class in 2018. And then I taught it again in 2019. And in the intervening space between 2019 and now, there's been an explosion of scholarship on Buddhism and race. Um, it's really, really exciting. Um, I would like to first center the great work that both of you are doing. Um, and as I say that, I am <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> in Anne Glegg's book, American Pharma. Um, I'm also thinking of Adina, uh, your work. Um, the thing that has been especially impactful to me is your JAR essay, Journal of the American Academy of Religion essay, Being Buddha, Staying Woke, Racial Formation in Black Buddhist Writing. Um, so I think that deserves a, um, a seat at the table, a place in the syllabus. So um, I'm not just saying that, I actually really believe that. Um, I have some books here, I'll just whip by your screen. They happen to be at, um, in front of me now. There are many other books that are wonderful that aren't right in front of me. So I'm currently reading America's Racial Karma by Larry Ward. Um, I also just got this book and I'm planning on reading it soon. Um, it looks like it would be a great book for a syllabus, um, Black and Buddhist. Um, and um, by uh, Pamela Ayo Yatunde and Cheryl Giles. Um, I'm also uh, excited by Rima Vesley Flad's work. Um, so I think she has a book coming out that we are eagerly looking forward to uh, called Black Buddhism and the Black Radical Tradition. Um, this one is on a list that this would be interesting. I would like to invite Lama Rod Owens to, I don't know if he has like lots of free time in his schedule for <laughs> hanging out with um, us academic types, but it would be really interesting to, to um, read Love and Rage um, and talk about that with him. It's been wonderful to see Jan Willis. Sorry, do I need to wrap up here? No, keep going. We love in this visual uh, <laughs> syllabus unfolding. No. Yes. Um, so I, uh, it's been wonderful to see Jan Willis speaking um, publicly in the last couple of years about um, her and, and before that as well with her um, autobiography, Dreaming Me, which came out in 2001. But I, um, I only just read it a couple of years ago and loved it. And um, so I think Jan Willis's work in general is really important and her pioneering life um, being one of the, the very few, one of the first perhaps um, African-American Buddhologist. Mm -hmm. She the first, I can't yeah. think of another one off the top of my head. Um, so um, this is a, a compilation of um, uh, her important elements of her life's work. And so I think that deserves a place. Charles Johnson, I'm going to speed up because there are just so many. Larry Ying, we <laughs> think together. Um, Zenju Earthland Manual, The Way of Tenderness. Ruth King, Mindful of Race. I just happen to have these in um, here, um, but there's many others as well, um, like Joseph Shea, Race and Religion in American Buddhism. Spring Washam, A Fierce Heart, Finding Strength, Courage, and Wisdom in Any Moment. It goes on. Um, so that's really exciting. And I Most think this is fantastic. And um, 
I think probably in 2019, if you told me, okay, now your next task is to teach an entire course on Buddhism and race, I would have sweat that a little. Um, and now it just seems that there's a plethora of resources inviting us to keep the focus. Yeah, well, I absolutely love that you kind of turn that last question into like a visual uh, kind of uh, platform. It was kind of reminded me of your student blogs. I'm like, I can see why you're an award winning teacher. So fantastic. Um, I'm really glad that you mentioned Jan Willis. You know, Jan Willis, you know, is, you know, a tremendous pioneer as a, both as a scholar and as an African American Buddhist practitioner. And I feel like in the last few years, you know, there has been this explosion of, you know, books by Buddhists of colour and black Buddhists. Um, but of course, this work has been going on for like over two decades, you know. Um, it's just really now that it's getting the attention from the mainstream, you know, Buddhist press and also from Buddhist studies. Um, so I think it's really important that we really like honour, you know, the pioneers. So I'm so happy that you did that. Um, I also wanted to add um, that Chen Zing Han has a brilliant book oh. called Be the Refuge. Yes. Um, which, you know, really disrupts that to Buddhism typology. Uh, it, I think it's got like 62 uh, interviews with Asian American Buddhists, uh, just such a plethora of richness. Um, and also our very own Sharon Su, you know, who's a Buddhist scholar and her, she did uh, occupy this body which is kind of auto-ethnographic and really engages, you know, issues of, of race and the racialized body, both, you know, in the Buddhist studies, where in the Buddhist in Buddhist studies as an as a as an academic community and you know American society at large. Um, so yeah, say, yeah, thank you so cool. much for thank you so much for bringing the those last two up. And I had in big print here, "Be the Refuge" by uh, Chen Shing Han. <laughs> I, I just didn't um, say it partly because I don't yet own the book, um, and so it's not part of my visual show and tell yet. But I can't wait to read it. Um, and also about that, I think. Um, in terms of conversation starters, I've used an essay by um, Funi Shu uh, that she published in 2017. Um, it's called We've Been Here All Along. It, it came out in Buddha yeah. Dharma and also Lion's Roar. And that has been really, really impactful um, mm. to students in, in my teaching. So I wanted to call um, Shu's scholarship out as well as really important. Well, yeah, no, that is a very powerful essay. And there's some of the responses she got from white practitioners are also we were very hostile, but are also really, you know, ped pedagogically, you know, strong to consider, you know, because I think often students are, you know, surprised at some of the backlash that, you know, black and brown Buddhists have received. Um, I did want to give one final shout out to Adina. Adina has a review essay on Buddhism and race and racism coming out in what what is it is it really is it religion compass so we're in the peer review process uh, it's supposed to come out with religion compass yeah which what I think is going to be just you know a great resource for for us all so it's good to end on a note of mutual acknowledgement <laughs> absolutely oh. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Jacoby, uh, and talking with us about your pedagogy, about teaching Buddhism and race. We really enjoyed it uh, and we appreciate it. We are going to put everything that was mentioned and showed uh, in the notes below this video once it is uploaded so then people can find it easily. Yeah. It's, it's an honor to be invited to be a part of this conversation and um, as for um, whatever contribution I've been able to make so far, it's really very much a work in progress. It's an aspiration um, and a goal that is still ahead of me, you know, that I'm still working it's towards. <laughs> Great. Bye, everyone. <laughs>